Uh, we are uh, Thursday, 21st uh, October, 2021, sorry. And uh, for the second discussion after Jeremy Dress, uh, I'm very glad to have with us uh, Sam Arthur from Nobro. Sam, how are you? How is it in London? It's uh, autumn, autumnal. The, the leaves are falling from the trees. And uh, yesterday it rained a lot. So it's very British weather. <laughs> so it's a kind of kind of the same weather in my hometown on the border of Germany. It's very windy. So now we will start uh, the question. Again, uh, thank you, Sam, uh, to be uh, with us uh, today. I think it will be uh, it's a chance. It's a great opportunity for the students to have you to have your feedbacks uh, about uh, uh, their question. So I'm gonna. I'm going to start my my question. Sam, could you tell us how you started your career in the publishing industry? So um, I started with my um, with my business partner Alex Spiro in 2008. Um, we started No Brow. Before that, I'd been working for about ten years as a um, a music video and a commercials director. So I worked on a combination, like lots of either live action or animated um, projects. So I've always been a storyteller. Um, that's the, the first thing. So for me, um, having the opportunity to create No Brow really was something very interesting because it was about telling stories um, and telling stories with pictures. And so No Brow in the beginning was very much focused on, on this concept. Um, publishing in the UK is obviously, you know, Britain um, and the English language, uh, you know, as kind of promoted in, in literary publishing in the UK, is, it's huge worldwide, it's massive. It's one of our biggest exports actually. Um, but from a visual perspective, there was not that much going on in the UK, you know? And this is something that Alex and I, we always looked at, particularly France, but Belgium, France, um, for, for the kind of the, the bon dessiné, for the visual narratives. And, and it's something that we don't really have in the UK. Not, not really, not in the same cultural tradition as, as you have in France. So we, we really wanted to make a publishing company that focused on um, the visual creators rather than on the literary um, creators as the, the kernel, the seed to start the project. And, um, and that's really how No Brow came about. Um, it was... A, a, a want, a need to create books with um, visual st stories, visual storytelling, graphic narrative, and and to make beautiful books, and 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 because of that, and because there wasn't much else in the marketplace in the UK, in France there are hundreds, if not thousands, of publishers doing similar things, but in the UK. We, we stood out quite quickly. And then actually in France, we stood out quite quickly just simply by the fact that we were a British company, you know, and, and there wasn't really that many others. So in France, everyone was like, wow, look at you guys, what are you doing? And, and we were kind of amazed by that actually and humbled by it as well. Because for us, you know, um, the, the publishing in France was much more interesting than the publishing in the UK. So for, it's very interesting uh, to, to give uh, how it was for the landscape of comics at that time in UK in 2008. And now, uh, how do you pick up? How is it uh, for the projects, for your line, for your catalog? How do you pick uh, the projects now? So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really, it's really difficult. Um, every project uh goes through a lot of development before we can um even begin to work on it as a, a contracted book 
so how do we find these things i mean you know it it's it they come from all they come from submissions people send us things they come from um from from agents like yourself they come from um the creators uh, they come from conversations they come from um they come from our acquisitions meetings uh every let's say five or six weeks we have what we call an acquisitions meeting um and it's the the kind of the the heads of department in my company we all sit around the table or on zoom or however we can get together these days and we discuss um new projects and so normally it will be the job of myself or one of my editors to pitch a new project to the rest of the team and it's our job as the um the editors to kind of persuade everyone else this is a good project this is something worth doing so it does take a lot of work to to get it to that point even where we can actually persuade people look this is a good thing to do and and that's i think a lot of people maybe they think oh we need a finished book or we or we just need an idea i mean it's either of those things or neither i mean you, every project is different and depending on what's going on in the world if you came up with a an idea which just happened to tap into something that everyone was talking to and you had it at exactly the right time and your other work demonstrated that you know you had a, an amazing visual style then maybe we would just snap our fingers and be able to commission that book but but to be honest it's quite unlikely that that would happen so usually what i have is um um so a sample of maybe the first chapter of a book or something um if it's not entirely artworked then maybe i'll have a draft and then i'll have a couple of images that are the, the final style of the artwork so in color and then maybe i've got a script or i've got a synopsis an extended synopsis of what the story is for the entire book um so that's typically the kind of thing that i'll have at the stage of acquisition sometimes we have a book from another language which has already been published or we have a book that's already been finished and we can just read it you know and so that's another way that we might find something um so yeah it's it's it, there's there's all different um stages of project um get commissioned in the end what do you prefer in your position as an editor uh you prefer to to start and to follow a project let's say from the beginning not exactly from scratch but really from the beginning or time to time you said maybe to buy a license from another country it it depends or how how you feel so, about it yeah the i mean in ultimately my my personal uh favorite is to work on something from the the beginning from when it's just an idea um because because then you get to see the development of that project and you get a real sense of um um job satisfaction accomplishment you know all of those things when you see it finished and when you see it hopefully successful but from a business perspective um there's also space to take on projects which are finished or that need a translation or that don't even need a translation that are perfectly good when they come in um because obviously if we have that we don't have to work as much on it so from the perspective of um um you know running a small business you, yeah you're spending less money on that particular project right so there's space for for all kinds of things and the thing about graphic novels is as much as we try to put schedules and timetables in place it's very difficult to um to really know how long something is going to take right so you know this is the this is the big thing for us and so some projects take years and um you know there's no point publishing something before it's finished <laughs> so you know because you're not 
you're not going to get very far with with that book so you know we we every project that we do is a risk for our business and um i'm not sure that that people or artists necessarily understand what what that means but you know we have a staff we have uh you know overheads we have rent um we've got to um we we do have a responsibility to continually sell our books for for our business for our artists as well because we pay royalties every year so we have you know we need to keep this this thing going so when we don't have books when we don't have them ready then we can't sell them and that's what we want to do we want to sell your books you know we want that's what we want to do we 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 love working on them but in the end we want to be selling them so while we're while we're editing them we're not making money out of them when we're selling them that's when hopefully we're making money so we need a combination of the two things always we need to be editing new material and we need to be selling material that we've already edited no, it's very interesting. Plus, I have to say, uh, you give, uh, in a good way, a lot of time to the authors. So it's really, uh, you are patient. Uh, you give time to the authors to think about maybe what could be improved or not. Sam, could you please uh, tell us uh, this example with uh, in waves? Uh, to know all the steps, maybe to, to give some information, if it's possible, about what was the first idea of uh, the author. Maybe mm -hmm. it was not exactly the same uh, regarding the final uh, story. And uh, could you please tell us how it was for In Waves? Yeah, so um, when before the pandemic um, and we were allowed to travel, and other people uh, from other countries were allowed to come and see us. Uh, we would quite often, I think every year, we would have a visit from Art Center, Pasadena um, Art College. Um, they had a, have a really good illustration, kind of graphics illustration course. And um, the students would always uh, come with their tutors to do a studio tour. And then one by one, they would always show us Uh, the project that they brought with them to present um, and on one of these trips um, a young man uh, called AJ Dungo showed me um, a project which was mainly made up of screen printed um, uh, artworks and little books and little prints and it was it was kind of all about a guy called Tom Blake who was a sort of surfing pioneer And, you know, I was just blown away by this project. I thought it was really, his illustration style was, was beautiful. The kind of production standard that he'd made, all of the things just showed how much he cared about the materials that he was using and the, the way that he was working was just very mature and, you know, really exciting. So um, a couple of weeks later, I got in touch with him and I said, you know, do you want to, maybe try and make a book out of this project. And AJ was really eager to do that. So he went away and we and he worked on a, a proposal and it was, um, it, it became a kind of book of, of, about, I suppose, maybe at my suggestion, I can't really remember, but possibly at my suggestion, the history of surf. Um, And I hadn't really seen anything like that particularly, and I'm certainly not in the kind of graphic novel format. So I thought it would be interesting. So um, I don't know, a couple of months went by, maybe a few, um, and AJ had been working away. And he came back to me with, um, with his proposal. And it was, um, it was basically about the history of surfing. So it kind of, And it's a similar story to one of the strands that's in the current book. Um, the, thing, the thing is, though, you know, during this conversation that I was having with, with AJ, um, I think over Skype, was, was just like 
I was just interested in, in finding out where this interest was coming from for AJ. So it was more of a kind of just a conversation. It was, it was like, this is cool. I like this project. I don't know at this point whether there's something missing or not something missing, but I just, I just wanted to find out more about AJ and, you know, why he was so interested in this particularly. And, and so I, I kind of asked him how he'd got into surfing and, and stuff. Anyway, he, he actually then began, began to tell me the story that is really the other story that's the main story in in waves which was to do with how he was introduced to surfing by by his girlfriend and at this point in time um you know really um tragically she she had only just died i mean she'd been she had, she had died maybe 3 months before this conversation that we were having and i was really shocked because i had no idea i didn't know at all and and how would i have done but aj wasn't you know like making me feel bad or anything he was just telling me and so i said you know i can't that wow that's really a powerful thing i i'm kind of really moved by by this story that he was telling me anyway and i i didn't i think at, at that point um I, I sort of had to think about it. Um, and, I, and I think we had a, a conversation a bit later where I, I kind of had, had this realisation that, that for, for this story, you know, to be amazing, and there's not that many amazing stories out there, but this, I thought, was an amazing story. And, and I just thought it would be an incredible thing to try and make a book out of it but equally I also knew it was a very personal and a very tragic thing for AJ and something that possibly he wouldn't want to do so I felt kind of bad asking him if he was interested even um so you know the conversation that I had with him was a difficult one for me and I think it was for him as well and then I suggested listen why don't why don't you try and do the book and we'll 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 make it about your story and then intertwine it with the story of the history of surfing because then there's more of a context and I feel that it's a story that people are going to be interested in and that they're going to be moved by. And he was he understood exactly where I was coming from. He didn't I'm not sure that he really wanted to do it to begin with. He didn't say this to me. He said he wanted to think about it. So he went away and he thought about it. And then he came back a couple of months later and he said, look, I've thought about it a lot and I think I really want to do it. Now, I, I don't even know how hard that was for him. I'll, I hope I never will have to go through what he went through. Um, but I'm really grateful to him that he made the decision to tell his story and, um, you know, to do it in in the way that he did, I think is is incredible. And that's why the book has done so well. So, you know, that's really how that book came about. And you could say, you know, it was a by accident. It's not by accident. It was, you know, it was AJ's, um, it, it, it was his passion and commitment to the, to the project that made it happen. Um, and for me, I suppose my role there was to act as a kind of prompt, as, as reassurance, um, to give confidence, to also give some narrative and creative feedback as well. Because it's still, even though it's his story, it needed to be um, structured and it needed to be um, um, edited, yeah. So yeah, that's that's that was the in waves story from my side. But uh, really, thank you because Sam, with this uh, example, it's really how to sum up uh, the job of an editor. I think you uh, you said everything, all the the steps of the creative uh, process. And for the students, again, I highly recommend uh, the reading of In Waves. Uh, it could be into English or into French. You can find it uh, published by Casterman. 
Uh, I have a, an, another question uh, for how is, for the structure, the architecture of the presentation of a project. I think you have done, uh, you say to the students a lot of information, but if you want to, to give some uh, further info, you are more than welcome. And in which form do you prefer to receive projects? Because you said, Uh, for uh, in waves, uh, you have met during a portfolio review uh, AJ. Now, because of the COVID, it's hard to travel. How mm. is it for you uh, to find? How is it uh, to find new project by snail mail to send a PDF? Uh, how that works nowadays? Yeah, I mean personally, I, I actually, despite the fact that I love printed things and I love books. Um, I actually prefer to receive PDFs as a, you know, something because I, I can, there's a reason for this. Uh, you know, we have two offices, we have uh, one of two, two staff in the US. So, um, and now, especially more than ever with COVID, not everybody works in the office. So when I, if I want to show things to people, It's much easier digitally. So if I have a PDF, I can I can share it with my colleagues. I can say, hey, I really like this. What do you think? And I can send it to them. So that's the main reason that I like to have a PDF. The other thing is, I mean, I'm not going to show you my desk, <laughs> but it's a mess. So if you send me something printed, it just gets put on my desk. And I I mean, I'm it's just going to get lost. You know, the other day I did find something at the bottom of a pile that someone had given to someone in my office who hadn't mentioned it to me, but just put it on my desk about six months earlier. And I thought it was pretty good, but I hadn't seen it. So it's not a good idea to do that, to send, send me things as a PDF. I think that's, um, that's very useful. Um, and in terms of, you know, like the, the way, the things that I'm looking for, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for, a very original voice that speaks to a re to the reader to any reader okay. so that that's difficult thing to quantify it's a difficult thing to articulate what makes it good or what makes it not good um, but in the end it's about communication so something that can communicate clearly to a reader I, I just think is much better than something that is difficult to understand, vague, you know, or hard to read, or, you know, any of these things. You need to be able to communicate. And that's what I'm looking for. An original, interesting, moving, um, fascinating, passionate way of communicating. Any of those things or all of them at once um is is what what i'm looking for it's also why your catalog is very international uh, because you just said you are looking for new voices but it could be a new voice from central america someone from russia why because that's not the dna of all the catalogs why you, you we feel it's like a, a shelter you like a crossroad of uh, Uh, voices from everywhere with the same uh, languages, the language of comics. But why this decision? Because maybe uh, you told us that in UK, the market at the beginning, it was not so big as the French-Belgian market. Or why this uh, choice to be very international and to be a, a window open to the world? Yeah, I mean... Why? Because with in, in publishing, um, different imprints are effectively a representation of the taste of the, the person, the publisher, really, I guess. So the filter that you see um, no brow through is the filter that we impose upon the, the work that we make. Um, I personally think that, um, you know, we, we, we cast a very wide net. So we're looking for 
really amazing projects so I don't really care where they're from I I love the fact that they're from all over the place um I'm not I don't think I necessarily that we necessarily went out to be um you know as international as perhaps we have become but I think we were always open to it we never saw it as a um a, a you know a restriction and I think that actually um for us beginning a, 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 a publishing business in 2008, the internet had arrived. It was well and truly, you know, installed on, everybody had broadband in 2008. It was normal back then. Um, so it was normal for us to be able to look at the work of artists all over the world via their websites. There wasn't that much social media in 2008. I think Twitter was just starting and Instagram was just starting. So it wasn't, they weren't, it wasn't the same way as it is now. But um, certainly if you wanted to communicate with an artist in another country, the only barrier was language. So, and even that didn't stop us when people didn't speak English. Sometimes we'd carry on regardless. And for this, could you please uh, tell us uh, an example of uh, some projects that, of course, uh, we, we think that uh, the presentation uh, was uh, or is in, in English, but the language of the writing for the text, for the dialogues, sometimes, is it uh, in other language than English? Or could you tell us? For example, for the students, if they want to, to send you some proposals, of course, he has to be into English, but uh, you think it would be fine for them to use and to write the story into French? How is it for you? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm speaking to you in English at the moment. My, my French is, is not great, but it's okay. And um, so I can, I, and I read French reasonably well with uh, with my friend uh, Google Translate uh, <laughs> next to me. Um, and when we very when we first started as well, Alex, um, who who no longer works in the business, he's still my business partner, but he he does another project now. He's fluent in in French so we we didn't have too too many problems so I, I'm quite happy to look at things that are in French w what happens is when I see something in another language that I don't have any you know I can't speak or but I think wow I love I love it then if it's in German or if it's in 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 Spanish then I try and find someone that I know and I respect and I ask them can you read it and tell me what you think and and tell me what the story is and what do you think of it honestly and then you know so in certain scenarios we have a book we're just about to publish called Kisses for Jet which is um which is going which we originally had in German um so we we had to We had to get someone to read it in German and tell us what they thought of it. And then we've got um, we're we're working on um, a couple of books where the 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 contributor is is native languages uh, mother tongue is Spanish. Most people speak English quite well, but not everybody. So it's interesting. And uh, sometimes it works quite well, and sometimes it's more difficult and. And it, it doesn't. I think we're lucky in the way that we're we, we're lucky in the sense that we speak English and a lot of people do have English as their second language. Yeah. So so we have that to our advantage. So for example, if if I'm if I want to work with with some with someone in China or or in South Korea or in Japan, then there's a chance that we can find someone that, that, that speaks both English and Chinese or English and Japanese. And, and it may be even we have people in our office that, that you know, can do that as well. So it's, it's, it's that kind of thing where we, we, we need as English language publishers, we, we should really use that as an, as an advantage to communicate with the rest of the world. And, um, And relying on only native English speakers, I, I feel is just closing down your your options a little bit. Yeah. Not that I don't 
want to work with English native speakers, but you know, let let's not let's not make a, a margin where we don't need one. Oh, again, it's it's very very interesting. So you just uh, told us that the language barrier could can be fixed, but uh, during the creative process, uh, as you said, it could be very long, and sometimes authors they can have. Uh, Uh, issues, uh, problems, doubts on their uh, project uh, mm -hmm. because it's a long step of uh, months. Uh, as an editor, how you can help uh, the authors? What will be the, the tips or the advices you can tell uh, to the student and also to the authors? Kumsuk uh, Jandrekim, for, for example, in South Korea, when she doesn't know how to continue a project, she will go hiking in the mountains. It, it will be refreshing for her. And then maybe a few days after, she will have a new idea. How is it for you? What yeah, you I mean, uh, well, I would just say that a problem <coughs> shared is a problem solved. So one of the main things is, is to share your difficulties, whatever they are, because hopefully we can find a solution. But the worst thing you can do is not tell anyone and not communicate. And, and then everyone freaks out because no one knows what's going on. And, and sometimes just small bits of information can just help every, everybody and, and, and can find solutions, you know, find answers to problems. So I would say the first thing that you need to do is communicate. That's all. Um, you know, secondly, there's, there's, there's such a thing as, again, and this sort of almost falls into what I've just said, but when you're very close to a project, in, in English we say you can't see the wood for the trees. Now, that's a very common situation for an artist to be in where they're so close to the project that they can't see the problem that's, that's right there in front of them they're too close so that's why an editor is really important and so you know we we sometimes need to tell you things you don't want to hear so you have to be receptive you have to you have to listen and and not you don't have to agree with everything that we say but you have to consider it you have to think about it and be objective and try and you know have that almost like that out of body experience where you're above yourself floating in the corner of the room, looking down at yourself. And then you can say, ah, okay, that's what I'm doing wrong. Or that's what I need to do. But you can't do that. If you only, you only listen to the little voice inside your head, you've got to listen to lots of other voices. You've got to listen to other people and you don't have to agree with them, but you have to listen to them and decide Why do I agree or not agree with what this person is saying? Maybe they have a point and, and play devil's advocate with yourself. No, it's, it's, again, it's great uh, tips. And I do think uh, the students, even in their career, uh, they will uh, rethink about what you are saying today. So uh, it's just great uh, for them to, to have you uh, here today. Uh, another question, uh, do you want to introduce, to talk to us uh, about a project you really like these days? Yeah, yeah, sure. Let me just, this is, um, we've just, we're just publishing this at the moment, which is um, by William Grill. And it's about, um, it's, it's a story of um, uh, uh, a really amazing elephant that, leads um, a kind of escape from Myanmar um, during the Second World War and with, you know, hundreds of refugees across the, the Myanmar-Burmese border with India to escape from the Japanese uh, military invasion. And it's by um, Will Grill, who, who we've worked with since the beginning of, of our children's book list, Flying Eye Books. Uh, and his first book was um, um, Shackleton's Journey. And that's one of our best-selling books that we've ever done, actually. 
and it's won lots of prizes and stuff. So this this book is is his third um, book. So it takes in, you know, lots of different things to do with deforestation, to do with logging, to do with um, the kind of uh, um, uh, to do with the way that elephants work within that industry to do with culturally how they're also part of of the the kind of society in in those parts of the world too and then also it's an adventure story so it's like it's a history lesson a geography lesson and an adventure story it's, it's great i love it and i worked on that one from quite early on too so i'm very proud of it shall we know the how long it was for the process of the creative uh, process for this project? That one is about three years. Okay. Wow. Quite long. Yeah. So I will jump. Uh, no, it's a great uh, uh, example. I will jump to another question. It's more uh, a personal question because I have the chance to ask you it. And sometimes to the convention, I don't have time to ask you this kind of questions. Which project you you would have been glad to to publish, and for different reasons, uh, uh, you are not the publisher of this uh, book uh, recently, or maybe in the past. Uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, a good question. One? So the one that I always feel upset about when I think about it, because I I you know I really wanted to publish it, was um, Blex Bolex, um, the Albin Michel. Yeah. book saison or seasons in in english and we 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 begged <laughs> to, we begged them to let us publish that book but we were very small at the time and and it was it wasn't we weren't the right publisher really i don't think at the time well no i think we were but the but but i did i really love that book and i just think it's an incredible book so even you know not even talking from a commercial perspective but just to, to have published that book I would have just loved to have done it because it, it was just such a for, to me it was just it was kind of perfect you know it was just a beautiful incredible piece of work so that was the one and then also um around the same time I was trying to develop a book with an illustrator, Canadian illustrator called John Classen. And um, and he hadn't been published at that point. He was he had just been working in animation. And um, and I and I just loved his work. I just thought he was brilliant and I just really wanted to do something. And then he said, Oh, listen, I really want to do something with you guys too, but I've just I've actually I've just signed a book deal with with a children's book company and um and I'm, I just need to finish that book and then I'll come and talk to you afterwards. And I was like, yeah, sure, fine. And then and that was, uh, I, I think it was, I want my hat back, which is a kind of international bestseller. <laughs> so he never came back to talk to us, obviously didn't need to by that point. But I always, I'm always, I don't necessarily think we would have published his children's book, but I just wish, you know, I would have loved to have worked with him on a book because I, I, I love his artwork so much. So that was, that's another one. Okay, so uh, we still have time. I mean, uh, I have a few questions more. And of course, the students uh, at the end, they, they already have, and they always sent uh, some questions. I just uh, copy past it on, on the chat, but uh, check it uh, after. Uh, so my, my next question is, uh, yeah, the publishing industry is, uh, is changing a lot. Uh, since a few years, how you see uh, it uh, like tomorrow, in two years, in five, ten years? How do you think? I know it's a multiple question, but how you feel with webtoons, uh, different platforms? Uh, you have been graduated from a uh, uh, Saint Paul Saint Martin in design, so how is it to see it uh, in digital? And I know you are. You really like the object of books. How you feel it uh, in the different perspective, short, middle, long-term visions? <laughs> I mean, you know, who knows? The, the thing is, um, you know, what do I, I think of all the different platforms? I mean, you know, any 
one that gets the opportunity to tell their story, to express themselves the way they want to express themselves. Um, that's a that's a virtue. And, and so any platform that allows people to do that is a good thing, in my opinion. Um, wh whether, you know, I think that there's always, there's a, there's always something about the physical book, which is, is going to be very hard to replace completely digitally, be just, just because of, you know, the, the things you can do with a book that you just, that doesn't happen digitally. So, you know, the fact that it is a physical thing, the fact that you can smell it, that you can touch it, the fact that you can um, leave it in a box outside your house and someone will come up and pick it up and take it and go home with it and read it and then maybe do the same thing. Or the fact that you can, you know, give it to a charity shop and someone will come and buy it. Or the fact that you can give your kid a book and they can drop it down the toilet and then you can put it on the radiator to dry you can't really do that with a uh, ipad or a, a mobile phone um so i don't know there's there's there'll probably at some point in the future be something comparable maybe um or you know it will get so difficult for us to to justify shipping and you know uh, making paper and all of those industrial uh, carbon producing things that, that it will be difficult to, to make books. But, but equally, we have the same problem with digital, you know, just because we don't have the carbon footprint from, from shipping things from A to B, we still have a massive carbon footprint from creating the, 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 um, the things in the first place and, and, and generating the electricity to to keep our little screens backlit for however many hours. So, you know, what is the future? I mean, I think it's gonna be a mixture. It'd probably be a mixture of even more mediums and mediums that we haven't thought of yet, you know? And I just think, yeah, even if we stopped, you know, printing books tomorrow, what do we do with all of the books that exist? They're not going away, we still have them. So there's always gonna be a book trade um and it might be that you know it just changes a little bit and i'm not suggesting that that we're, we're going to stop printing books but i'm just saying you know it hypothetically if we did you know there's billions and billions of them and and the biggest online retailer in the world started off only selling books amazon is a, a bookseller first and yeah. foremost and now it sells everything else it's not an accident, you know, that they managed to create the business off the back of selling books because of the, the kind of classification system of, and, and the kind of sales and marketing systems that they've employed could be translated into other products. So, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not even, I don't even think we're at a crossroads. We're just, we're just on, a, on, a, on a road and the road is is going to go a really long way for for publishing because in the end we make stories and as long as people want to listen to stories or read stories or watch stories books are going to be important may i ask you did you miss sometimes the time of uh, the zine time of uh, nobo i mean with the magazines and the limited edition and a second question inside the question are you you are not obliged to answer me uh, and to answer are you thinking to return or to to go to another market or or it's not uh... do i do i miss it i mean those are very specific times which which were fun but i was i was you know 10 years younger and um I mean, you know, again, it's a journey that we've been on. I, I don't think I would go back to then because I feel like where we're going now is what I'm interested in. Um, yeah, but I mean, would I take, would I not do it? No, I'd loved it. It was amazing. It's brilliant. So Sam, I think, uh, yeah, it's time to, to go and to uh, move forward from the question from the students. Uh, we got a lot of questions. So I will try to be a filter of mm -hmm. questions. 
So, but uh, I sent uh, you all the questions, but uh, I will start with the first question, but if you see on the chat something you really want to answer, do not hesitate to say, okay, Nicola, I want to answer to this question. Me, I will start, I like this question. Okay, so I take the voice uh, of the person who asks the question. Hello, do you think that a book that is not autobiographical graphical, it's hard for me to do English, but in a fantasy style, can reflect the culture of the mentality of the author's country anyway. So I will, I will send you this question. Yeah, I can see it in the chat. Yeah. Um, okay, so in a way, um, Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of discussion at the moment about, I suppose, um, this in publishing this idea of own voices. So, um, you know, finding authentic voices that that are telling a story, and, and I think that's on one on the one hand, I think for something like let's take for example AJ Dungo's story. You know, absolutely, it's it's um, autobiographical. Um, so, so there's something amazing and brilliant about anything like that, and I and I really I'm interested in those kinds of stories that are maybe coming from a different part of our society, country, I don't know, wherever, somewhere a bit different that we haven't heard from before. It's important that we hear those stories, but equally, it's important that a writer, an artist, has the opportunity to create stories that are from outside of their experience because then how do we create fiction if we're not able to do that how can we try to to write other characters that we don't necessarily they're not me but how do I write that character that is within my story that is not me you know you we need to be able to do that and so what I would say to the this is yeah, you. Yeah, there is there is opportunity for that, um, but I think what you need to do is it needs to be very well researched, and that's what has to happen with with any um, storytelling. If it's not believable, uh, even if it's fantasy, you know, or science fiction, if you don't believe it when you're reading it, then you just you just can't help but think, God, that's. BS, you know, I, I don't, I'm not buying this. Whereas if you, if it's really well researched, then if, if you can just suspend that person's disbelief for a moment, then you've done a good job. So that's really what I think you need to be aiming to do. I think, does that answer the question? I'm not sure if it does, but. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a, it's a, an overview of uh, what was uh, the question uh, and your answer. Next question. So it's uh, good afternoon, Sam and Nicola. Thanks for the discussion. There are a lot of graphic novels met with digital tools. Is it because it's what you prefer? I mean, do you appreci appreciate traditional work? Too. So it's like a question from your interview from pencil and pixels. So, mm. um, I mean, yeah, of course, I appreciate um, traditional um, ways of working. I think what it comes down to is practicality. You know, like I love the way traditional artwork looks, but sometimes it can be quite impractical in terms of getting things done on a deadline so for example and actually i'm working with someone at the moment um who's who's a, a, a couple of people who do work all manually so by hand and um their processes are entirely by hand and then they have to scan or photograph the work and send it to us so that's one extra stage that slows the process down. So for example, if, if, they, if there was a way of taking out one of those processes and making it digital, it just means that it exists in the, in the computer. It means it's quicker. 
Does it make it better? Well, it, it might or it might not. Does it make it worse? It might or it might not. So I, all my question is back to the artist is, you know, it, are there ways you can make making your work more efficient without us losing any of the quality? And if the answer is after you've looked at it, yes, then it's a good thing to do. If the answer is no, then you just need to try and make the make it as efficient as possible and hope that you find an editor that is um, uh, understanding. So, thank you, Sam. I think if it's fine to you, maybe we have time to one or two last questions. So yeah, fine. Uh, I can keep uh, going. There's okay, no so the, the next one. So you can see it. I thank you again for your time, both of you. My question is, is there some differences between editing in France and in England? Or this is the same process? I would add also, is it the same in North America? So honestly, I only know my process. <laughs> I don't know anyone else's. I haven't worked for another publisher, so I don't know. Um, so I don't know if it's different or not. I don't know, honestly. I can't answer that question. I, I think that probably in, I don't know. Sorry, so no idea. Maybe, maybe I can answer because- uh, Yeah, you probably have not, a better understanding. I, I mean, uh, I think what is key uh, from my perspective and what I can feel with the authors you are working with and for is you, you give time, you give remarks, but then as you said, it's remarks. So it's mm. not a, a commission. So it's very different. And then uh, the authors, uh, they will say, okay, but they, it makes them think about the remarks. Right? And I think this is not sometimes not exactly the, the same uh, on the other side. I mean, on the European uh, part, mm. uh, on the French, Belgium uh, scenes. So, so, so we can continue to another question or Sam, you can pick a question you really want to answer. I will copy past. So, so for example, like, for example, I can't answer the question about remuneration structure because I don't yeah. know how no, it, it's in no, France, it, so. it would be, it will be tricky to, to answer yeah. because you need to have the two uh, comparison. Yeah. And I don't to compare. Uh, the new one, I think, uh, could fit in my mind. Uh, do you, f uh, you can see it? Do you follow some rules with regard to the book structure you're, you are publishing? I think in Jot Stanton books, there are a particular structure which gives to it a particular rhythm. Or maybe to about uh, Americana, maybe, if you want to, to tell about Americana, it's up to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we've done, I mean, I think we, we kind of approach each book quite differently, I feel. So um, with Joe Todd Stanton, for example, um, his Brownstone series, which I think is Sabarkan in, um, yeah. in, in France, we, we have a kind of, they're all, they're a little bit more of a formula to them because it's, it's kind of like each adventure follows a certain rhythm, definitely. But then with, but then that's okay for that because it's kind of, it's kind of a formula. Um, that makes it sound not good, but it, 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 each story is very different and each character is very different, but it's the same number of pages. And we have the same kind of layout of and, and the way that the the dialogue is is and the story is 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 told by around the pictures. Whereas with his picture books, it's it's kind of quite different. Um, and that's the difference between a picture book and you know more of a kind of graphic novel. But then with um, with graphic novels, I'm always you know. I, I want to try and find the best method to t tell the story. So with Americana, for example, Luke 
Healy really wanted to have a mixture of prose and um, comics because he did. He felt that he couldn't really tell all of the story with one or the other. He needed both. And we've not really done that before, but I think it really worked in that book. But I'm not sure if it would work in other books because it's a different, it's a different story. And then in um, Memories from Limon, which we've just published um, with Edo Brenes, you know, the, the structure with that was, was um, quite interesting to work with because it, it jumps around in um, um, uh, chronologically. Um, and that's quite a complicated um, way of telling a story. So that's, you know, that, that was really difficult to kind of really, you know, understand it and, and try and make sure that the reader is, is understanding what's happening. And, and I, I, I always, one of my favourite films is The Godfather Part Two, just, just because of that idea of, of like jumping between narratives and and I just think that's like something that I always think of and I I still when I'm talking to authors I probably give them more film references than I give them book references to be honest but that's that's how I think maybe so I apply a lot of um my kind of visual storytelling is film but I still think that that kind of storytelling applies really well to the graphic novel um as too like, so, yeah like for example maybe for Edo uh, you said maybe in the mood for love uh, from uh, Wong Kar Wai or this yeah. kind of, uh, of reason so it's a, and I guess it's also because of the backgrounds your backgrounds on the music videos Yeah, yeah, for sure. But also the idea of almost color coding too. So we did it in, in waves where certain uh, certain chapters are certain colors in order to differentiate between different kinds of story on different eras or and it's the same in, in memories from Le Monde. We we use color as a, a signifier for, for different parts of the story. Um, and that gives the book rhythm as well, which I think is really important. So I'm very interested in the way that you can use all of the different things, whether it's, um, you know, prose, whether it's um, uh, mark making, whether it's color, line, all of these things can add rhythm and, and um, accentuate the, the story in the ways that you want to. And that's that's how we. Those are the tools that we have. That's what we. That's what we need to to use to the the best of our ability to the to to their um, maximum. Sam, I think uh, we are done. We we are we have uh, done all the questions. Uh, again, uh, I really want to to thank you uh, to be a part of uh, the discussion today. Uh, with the, the students, so I do. See... I would just say one 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 of the things is, is it possible oh, yeah. for a French for a French artist to work in the UK? Um, yeah, definitely. There's not that. I think as long as you have an open mind, but it's it, it's only we're telling stories with pictures that can't be that different, basically. So as long as you're prepared to work with with you know someone who who might have voted for brexit uh, i didn't by the way then then it's fine but but hopefully we can still work together i think that's no, that's no I, uh, i really like uh, what you are saying it uh, maybe we can feel we are a little bit uh, far uh, now because of brexit but uh, thanks to uh, Uh, publishing companies like you, I think it's uh, on the opposite. Uh, we are closer and uh, I'm glad that you say to the students that they can uh, pitch you some projects, they can send you maybe when their portfolio will be ready again. So yeah, of course. I love that. Without, in the end, without, you know, you guys out there doing yeah. things, we're, we're nothing. So, you know, we need, 
that's the, I'm always looking. I'm always want to find new things. Yeah, please do. So uh, again, Sam, thank you. Uh, I wish you the, the best uh, for uh, the end of the year. I hope next year uh, Fulham will join the, the first league. So we'll... They will, they will. But they'll go probably <laughs> straight back down too. So, so again, uh, I hope uh, the students, they will have the chance uh, to meet you maybe in person in the future at some point in convention in Angoulême. I'll be in Angoulême in, in, uh, in January. So that's one place. Oh, yeah. So uh, students, keep, keep it in mind for January for the rainy days of uh, Angoulême. Uh, so, okay, Sam. Take care of you. And uh, again, thank you for this very, very interesting discussion for the students. It was a pleasure. My pleasure.